Go Hope. Hello, everybody. It's Ron and Hope Unfiltered, and You're welcome back, back to You're me. Back. To me. Yes. Yep, I've done about nine of them. You have not. Yep. Without your you presence with me. I had a few. Yes. And the, the views go down. No, they do not. They go down when you're not with me. But I'm glad to be back. But I'm back. Yes. Well, I'm, what's in here? Tell them how bad I used to drink Mountain Dew. This is Mountain Dew. Okay. It's been like, how many? How long has it been since you've seen me with a Mountain Years. Dew? Years. 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 Okay. But he used to drink at least a six-pack of Mountain Dew a day when we first got married, when I first met you even, when we were dating. And then when Please we got married. Please say it was a six-pack of Mountain Dew because I have people get here and want to know we're what talking kind of six-pack of beer I like. Yeah. We're talking about Mountain Dew. Yeah, okay. Six-pack of Mountain Dew. <laughs> okay. So he would drink those and then wonder why he stayed up all night. Yeah, I couldn't sleep. And then I went to the doctor. Well, that was about 30, 28 years old. Look, you're already old. shaking your leg. And you've yeah, been... he had one in a while. Here we go. 28, 30 years old, and doctor, he, he was a, he's a much older guy. He was about at retirement age then. He looked at me and said, son, you're high. <laughs> Remember he said, I he do. said, you're high. He said, that's why you can't sleep. And I'm like, but I did. It wasn't that I guzzled Mountain Dew. It's that I had these big thermoses. You remember those giant thermoses I, I had? Do. And I would just keep Mountain Dew in it from morning till I went to bed at night. And by the time you got through, ain't no telling how many of them I And then drunk. we had our first child. And you think maybe some of that And because you blood. always had a Mountain Dew in your hand. You know how kids will want to just like gravitate. They want to drink, Especially whatever. Chase. Especially so they chase. want it. Ron let him taste it one time, Chase. and he loved it. And then I gave it to him in his bottle. Yes, I came home one day, and there was Mountain Dew in Chase's bottle. And let's let's on the record bottle. They don't, they don't know not Chase. sippy cup. The last person that needed Mountain Dew in a bottle was our oldest son Chase. He had tears going down his but face he was, and want more. He was, he was sucking on that bottle as hard as he could because yes, he, he absolutely loved it. But anyway, I train them up in the way they should go. Yeah. <clears throat> Started them when they were young. I am glad to have you back. And I went out to a little <clears throat> vending machine and got me something to drink because you got me drinking greens, yeah. and it has left the worst taste in my mouth. Oh, I don't my know what word. it is. And I had to get something, so Mountain Dew just seemed like to be the right thing to do. Okay, well, I'm glad you did. What are we talking about today? Tell them, tell them because I've been going off on a tangent, so you've been trying to calm me down. And then you said, I'll tell you what, get get it all out at the podcast. So tell them No, what. I said, let's talk about the subject, you know, the subject matter, kind of spinning off of what you have just started preaching about the worship series. Uh, let's talk about weird church and how so many people don't want to be a part of a church that's weird and... How you may not get another word in, so get it all in there. Because when I go off, I'm gonna. You go know, off. if you read your Bible, um, and a lot of people don't, but if you read That's your Bible, the problem right there. Well, I'm just talking about people in general. That's the problem. Who, I'm talking about leaders. If you really read your Bible and just read through it, there's a lot of weird things that happen when Jesus was around. Foolishness to us, yeah, but wisdom to God. Yeah. Because God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because Jesus, when he was on earth doing miracles, signs, and God wonders. God coming in Bethlehem in a manger is foolishness. Yeah. Everything about a, it is an weird an un, and odd. To an unwed 15-year-old, that's foolishness. Yeah. Right there. Just coming out of the gate with that Spitting story. Spitting on people's <clears throat> eyes. That's foolishness. It's foolishness. That's foolishness. I mean, and I can go over and over and over again, taking a blind man and removing him from his familiar surroundings. Yeah, leading him when, out of town. When that's all he has is to remember how many steps left and then how many steps right, and that's his only navigation system. And Jesus removes him from all of that to get him a heathen. Why can't he just look at him and say, eyes open? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, his ways are oh, not no. our as, as the ways. heavens are above the earth. So are his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. And I, I do have an extra grind. And I'm not this kind of guy. I don't jump in on political stuff. I don't jump in on when an entertainer has said this or done this or what do you think. Everybody's talking about Taylor Swift and the guy for the Chiefs. And, yeah. you know, I, I'm like, I Kanye just, I just and everybody. We don't talk about when, it. When Kanye was going around doing church stuff, and I'm like, I could care less. I just really have never been. 
even when I was younger and now, I'm just not into that. I'm so into the kingdom. I'm so into what the Word of God says. I'm so into trying to accomplish mission. And I just never have been interested in pop culture. But there's something that is happening that I think has a chance to have major negative reverberations. And I'm going to speak to it because, honestly, I've been doing this now with you, Hope, thir- th- uh, three and a half decades, mm-hmm. almost 35 years. And sometimes at some, when you're 55, some, you think you've earned the right to speak sometime because I've, I've been through a lot. I've seen a lot. You've and lived I've seen, a lot. I've lived a lot, and I've come through a lot. And so you get a perspective that a 28-year-old spouting everything off like he know, got the world by, by yeah. the tail, he just does not have. Right. Because <clears throat> he hasn't had a chance to live enough Yeah, you just yet. haven't lived long enough. <clears throat> and, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are leading churches now, and they still think all oh, this is just fun. <laughs> they they haven't got out of the fun state. You remember that stage? We were, yes. It's just all fun. They they hadn't been sued. Right. They hadn't been investigated. They ain't had the they people they invested in most. Kid the problems or they marital had kid problems. problems. They've never had a diagnosis. Yeah. They've never had insomnia. They've never fought panic attacks. They've never had deadlines. They've never felt debt. They they just have not had all that. They've never had their wife walk in and say, "I don't want to be married to you in ministry." They've they've never had to take care of their parents. I mean, right. they just all these things that life teaches you and quite honestly humbles you. Yeah. And there is this thing, I think, when you're coming up in something, you see what everybody's doing wrong, and you got all the answers. And then life has a chance to begin to kick you in the teeth a little while, and you've done everything you can just to find enough faith to hold on and recover. Yeah. And a lot of these people that are speaking so loud have not had these experiences yet. They will have them. Yeah. I remember Uh, early in our uh, marriage, I remember somebody said, when you first get married and when you start off in life, you know, every there's so many things that are so important to you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's it's wide. And you have, you know, you want to do this, you think this, you got opinions about that, you critique. But the longer you live, it's like the gap closes. And it comes just very, 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 very few things Let that you, uh, that you love and that's, that's important right. to you. And the things that really matter, the older you get. Like, I had a birthday party with my family. Well, my family wanted to know what I wanted to do for my birthday. And I said, I just want to be with y'all and the grandkids and have fun. You know, I just want to go. It don't have to be a fancy restaurant. I just want to go somewhere where we can laugh and have fun and have a memory. Now, maybe 10 years ago, what I would have wanted would have been different. Mm-hmm. But the older you get, the more you learn, and, the, and your priorities are different. When you're young, these many things are important yeah. to you, and you got these all these things you want to do, but you got this many options. Yeah. When you get older, this many things are important to you, and you, and got, you got a lot this of options. Many options. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's just a different season of life. I want to speak from the season of life, and I don't want to speak just to be axe grinding. I want to speak out, and I want guys to send this to people you know, and maybe even people who fit what I'm talking about. Uh, I want you to subscribe. I want you to like. I want you to share. I want you to do all that stuff, because I think this really has a possibility to have negative outcomes that if it is that if it's continued will be hard to recover from. Mm. And here's my major concern. My major concern is a whole generation never experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When I say a whole generation, Hope, I'm talking about pretty much an entire generation because if you held a gun to my head and the generation after us, if you told me to name you a half a dozen leaders in the Spirit-filled thought and in the Spirit-filled move, I could not name you six names. That we know. Not leaders in that. Now, they're leaders. Mm Mm-hmm. But that's not what I'm saying. I didn't say who has the most followers. I didn't say have they built a savvy church. I'm not talking about that. But they are leading people in the spirit-filled, spirit-led life where the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, because all three give gifts, are operational constantly and welcomed in their ministry and yeah. taught and discipled to their people. I could not name you five names. And whatever it looks like, <clears throat> whatever it sounds like, 
Holy Spirit, come do, have your way Period. in our church That's and in only, our service. The only answer you have to the Holy Spirit is yes. Yes. Now, I want to say, say we got, I'm, I'm going to tell you where this has really ticked me off. I <laughs> have a network of pastors, um, 249 now. I thought it was seven. I've had, just had two more join, got two or three more in process. So 250-ish pastors and a network with, diff, with varying levels of relationship to mm-hmm. me. And I have somebody who oversees that, Pastors Dwayne and Tasha, who actually, I don't call them that, but they function biblically as a bishop. Yeah. They oversee this entire network for us. I am apostolic. I am a voice into it. Uh, but they really run it. And so I sent them to one of the foremost church planting uh, networks in the earth. Maybe the greatest one ever mm-hmm. since the book of Acts. Really, really got their stuff together. They were not speaking. I want to make that clear because everybody knows who I'm talking about. Those gentlemen are my friends. And those gentlemen right now, if they needed anything, I would get on a plane and I would be there. Okay? It is people who are speaking at the conference. At these extended conferences that are a little smaller on their behalf. So this was not the 2,500, 3,000 one. This was a 150, like a 200 one? one. I don't know if they call it that, but it was an extended one. And my my guy, who is a millennial, yeah, Pastor Dwayne's a millennial, came back. Honestly, I asked him about it, and he's not one to criticize. You know Dwayne I and know. Tasha. They're just not ones to criticize. But after I got with him, I pulled him a little aside. He said, I'm really troubled. And he said, why? He said, well, let me tell you some of the quotes that I wrote down. Number one, he said, this is a quote. He's teaching all these prospective church planters. And the guy representing the organization who was training the pastors right. said this, quote number one, if you are animated as a preacher or delivery in your ministry, your church will not grow. That is a quote. Okay. <laughs> well, that's just not true. That was right. In other words, talk. You know, have props, talk, be topical. Tell stories. That if you're a if preacher, you, you basic, will, it will not line. grow. Yeah. Okay. And I can't even tell you how many scriptures the Bible talks about, and how will they know if there is no preacher? Right. I mean, this is so much. Second thing that bothered me bad was someone was asking him, "What about if you are in the spirit filled persuasion?" And, you know, you want to minister in the gifts. You want to lay on of hands. You want to anoint with oil. You want to see God move. And they said, nope. They said, those are the crazies. Wow. We let them come on Wednesday night, and we don't promote it. Wow. That is a quote, if I heard it correctly. So those are the two quotes out of everything I heard that hope I'm going to be honest with you. Have you ever seen me pick a fight? You've seen me fight, but I don't think you've ever seen me pick Maybe one. once in a denomination. In, a deno- in the denomination. <laughs> I, okay, I'll own that. Yeah. The denomination that I was that I had, was born in and came out of, yeah, I had some you times did. where I had to defend myself and I had to fight pretty good. But I don't go around just calling folk no, out and all that. That's don't. not the nature. It's not my nature. Pretty easy going. Uh, I would have had a very difficult time to sit in that room. Right especially in a smaller setting like that. If it had been 2,500, I wouldn't have done a thing. Yeah. But if there's 100 pastors in there, I would have had a difficult You'd have raised time. your hand. Yeah, I would have had a tough time just doing nothing. I don't know what I would have done, but I know too much. I've experienced too much. Right. And whenever somebody has experienced something, your argument, doctrine, theology— Can never outweigh you, it. Your experience yeah. never bows a knee to another person's teaching. no. Ever. It's like if somebody's standing up saying healing's not for today, but you know you just got know, healed. But I know, but I know, <laughs> I went and the tumor's gone. Yeah. You know, I don't care what doctrine. I don't care what book you write. I have experienced healing. Right. And the man who built his house upon the sand, you know, heard the word and didn't do it. The man who built his house upon the rock, he heard the word and he did it. What's the difference? When you execute word, you've experienced it. Mm-hmm. When you've experienced something, you can't be moved. Right. And um, so I wanted to respond to those two things, and I want to respond. This is what's used over and over. Now, this happened to some of the guys in my network who were younger and would ask me to come preach. 
And I told you it started bothering me because they would pick me up preaching. You, They know what I am because I mentored a lot of them. Mm-hmm. But they, in their church, were saying, now, Pastor, if, if you would, don't blah, 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 blah. Don't speak in yeah. tongues. And if you would, tonight, you know, don't, don't prophesy tonight. Mm-hmm. And if you would tonight, and, I'm, and I would keep my mouth shut to be respectful for what they had built, but it started becoming a more common occurrence with my younger guys who was coming mm-hmm. up. And here's the word I heard over and over, weird. We don't want our church to be weird. Mm-hmm. We don't want our church to be, it's almost like somebody somewhere said it and everybody heard it yeah. because they all used the same thing. And I've heard other people in clips and stuff, you know, don't weird people out in your church. Mm-hmm. Don't make church weird. Well, the reason, and do you agree with me, that that kind of started maybe 15 years ago was A because— to us. Well, I think that too, but I think it's because the church planting uh, movement, the church planting schools— really said our mission now is to be a church planting uh, facility to help people plant churches, and your goal should be only to get people saved. That's a whole nother podcast. But that was the the goal, was to get people saved. So why do all this okay. other stuff Jesus, when we just should be getting people thing. saved? The goal of Jesus and the original intent of God was not to get people saved. If that's the case, just have son, just have church on Easter and shut the rest of it down. He said, make disciples. Mm-hmm. That's right. Go into all nations and make disciples. Disciples and getting saved are a Grand Canyon apart. And you are right. Churches have stopped being discipling centers. Yeah. And now they're soul winning centers. Soul winning was made to take place by In the your marketplace. Witness. Yeah. Out, you outside will of be church. be my witnesses. So you, all of Jesus' Soul winning, all of Jesus' forgiveness of sins, all of his miracles took place not in a synagogue, took place in the market street, yeah. in the marketplace and in the street. So that is where that's why he said, go into the world, not try to get the world into to come to the church. church. He said, go, 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 go. So the intent of God was that the salvation experience would come through the testimony. And the witness of people mm-hmm. when you speak into their needs, their hurts, and yeah. their deficiencies. Bring them to the house of God. That's a different thing. Mm-hmm. Those are where God's protocols are established. That is where God's house is. But we are living stones being built to become a holy habitation, Ephesians 2, where God can dwell mm-hmm. by his spirit. Yeah. God assembles people in the body to where they are a place where he can come and make habitation. So the whole thing is about discipling people to be spirit-filled, to be spirit-led, to walk in the spirit. And when we get together, we become a collective habitation of the spirit. When I make everything in my church about soul winning, then I have forever basically committed my people to ankle-deep waters. Yeah. I understand. We don't teach them how to overcome in this life. And they say they're doing it in life groups. They are not doing it in life groups. Yeah. Life groups are not a training center. Life groups are where they're building community. Yeah. I've been to I've I've been to the biggest and baddest. I've asked them some of them right to their face. What do you do it like? They build community. They make connections. They get people a friend. And uh, it is not a discipling and training center because the administration of trying to disciple through a cell group is ominous. Oh yeah. And so now what we have is a generation where we're doing every type of gimmicky thing in the world to get somebody saved, and the intent was to raise up, it was the intent of God, Hebrews 2 and verse 10, to raise sons to glory, Mm -hmm. to make the captain of their salvation perfect. Is there such a thing as imperfect salvation? No. But what he means is, Everything that Jesus did on the cross has not been maximized until we function in the glory. The glory is the presence, the manifested presence, and the weight and the authority of God. Whatever Adam called it, that's what it was. Why? Because he was crowned with glory and honor. So can that happen? Absolutely. Well, listen, can that happen Without weird things happening at church. Well, let's go on to that so I don't take too much time. I have no idea how much time Can I Can that left. happen? I hadn't been on them. I hadn't got a clock in front of me, so just let me keep talking. I don't know that I have a certain time I want to end this anyway. Stay with me. Okay. <clears throat> God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. First Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 1, excuse me. Then it says... 
The foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of men. Okay? Hope, I can give you great music and authentic, passionate worshipers who love Jesus and still never experience his presence because his presence has protocols. A priest touched the Ark of the Covenant mm-hmm. trying to keep it from falling off a cart and Fell God down killed dead. him. Yeah. There is nothing wrong with our great music and our big gatherings and worshipers. There's nothing wrong. I'm not critiquing that. Good intentions. But people have got to understand, in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy, <clears throat> and at his right hand, pleasures forevermore, and that only the anointing destroys yokes and lifts burdens. And you can have music, production, and worship, and not have anointing, and not have the presence of God. And if the people have never tasted the presence of God, then what they have will do. They so don't I know don't, the difference. I don't think it's a generation that don't want the Holy Spirit. I think it's their handlers. I think the preachers won't let it get to them. Because whenever they invite me, they know what Ron Carpenter's about. Mm-hmm. And whenever they invite me, they already, they got don't, don't, don't. don't. So, and I'm almost like, well, why did you invite me? Because that they don't want, they're afraid that it will become what we're talking about, weird church. Because they don't know how to steward moves of God. Mm-hmm. Stewarding a move of God is a lot different than Tuesday getting in a planning service on Planning Center and putting your three songs together, your 17 minutes, and your click tra- track for your five campuses. Yeah. That's not stewarding a move of God. A move of God is when people have experiences to which they will never be the same. Hope, I'll try to do this without get it without crying. Bible school didn't change me. Theology classes and Greek classes didn't change me. Going to somebody's conference rarely changed me. It was a thousand upon a thousand experiences mm-hmm. with God. That made me who I am. It was times where I got out of his presence and I knew I would never be the same. It was when Moses left and the glory of the Lord shone on his face. And I'm sure seeing a burning bush, it was weird. You can't explain it, but what, you're different what because it, of it. Let me go see this strange sight. <laughs> yes. What is it? A bush. <laughs> That will not be consumed. Yes, Hope, it's strange. When, when the presence of God by the power of the Spirit fell, Jesus said, I'm about to go back to heaven, go tarry in Jerusalem till the gift that I promised you comes. They got in the upper room in one accord, and when the presence of God, like a mighty rushing wind, came and the Holy Spirit manifested in their midst, the onlookers, yeah. the people we don't want to be weird to, yeah, the onlookers, looked at that, and the only point of reference they had with what they were seeing was drunkenness. Yeah. I promise you, there ain't nobody looking at none of our churches thinking we're drunk. There's not anybody looking at any of our conference. We have the prettiest, most polished, put together, production, presentation, conferences, and gatherings I have ever seen in my life. My generation would pack out buildings and pack out arenas and watch God rip the place apart. But I think both's important to God because building the temple, he, <clears throat> I mean, he gave exact specifications, exact Talk dimensions, exact ways you're supposed to lay the wood, what kind of wood, and then the glory would come. So I think he wants us to be excellent in everything we do, but be willing at the same hardiness to say, God, come take, come breathe, come take over. God, come sweep in and just flood this place. Yeah, so see, I believe help, there's both. See, help, I can't control that part. Yeah, right. And we're not supposed to. I can't control that, but that's 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 the whole premise that I'm getting at. Yes, when when Jesus walked in Mary and Martha's house, Martha, there were two parts of Jesus. I love how you say Martha. Martha was sitting there 
sweep. She, let me let me let me take some liberties with this. She's sweeping. She's dusting. She's stirring the soup. She. What is she doing? I want to make sure the man mm-hmm. Jesus is comfortable. All the natural things. Okay, because Jesus is one hundred percent man. Mary sits at his feet in a posture of worship Mm -hmm. because Jesus is also 100% God. Mm -hmm. And Jesus makes this statement that I used to not understand until I thought about the portions. Jesus told Martha that Mary has chosen the greater portion. There was my humanity when I walked in to minister to. There's my deity than when I walked in to minister to. And Mary has chosen Mm -hmm. to minister to my deity. Here's what I'm getting at. We have now a generation of churches that know how to host man. Yeah. But we have no idea how to host God. So good. So we've got to do a million things from being the latte church to everything else we do to keep people's interest Mm. because we don't know how to host God. And God is the greater portion. Yeah, we've got he to. Said, yeah, he says, fooey on your other stuff mm-hmm. if you miss this. Yeah. I want you to be able to host both. Yeah. And redemption has always tried to be a hybrid. I hold things to a high bar. I hold things to a high standard. I want everybody to have a great experience. I want everything to be done right. I want the building in tip-top shape. I have standards that are excellent, and I hope that that is pleasing to the Lord. But when that service starts— yeah. The greatest thing that could happen is for God to come through an open heaven and rip the roof off that place, and those people have an encounter that a thousand messages can't do, right. and a thousand altar calls can't do because God. Because we met know with the power people. of it. Yes, and we've that's been what, in them. That's what I was, I, and I was casting vision for our West Coast people who never experienced that. I said, "You got to understand, me and Hope have been in services yeah. where." The whole building was full of drug dealers at a kingpin's funeral in our church. And we started the first song of praise and worship, and the whole building started puking. I could see their faces. They're like, what? For what? Yeah, they're like, for what? Because two kingdoms clashed. And that we're not having a kingdom clash. Every our every usher we had was running around with trash cans because hundreds of people are throwing up yeah. because demons are being confronted in the presence of God. And hope that was not that big of a deal for us. It was nothing for back here. Four people are getting saved, and there's been no altar yeah. call. And over here, we see a man that this woman's been praying for for 18 years, is hugging his wife. He walked in drunk. Now he's sober. We got a guy coming down the middle of the aisle throwing drug paraphernalia. Well, so, so, Pastor, what did you preach? I hadn't preached. Yeah. I hadn't given an altar call. But we, it's the presence of God. But we prayed and begged for the presence oh, of God to show up. That was that's what all we, we valued. wanted. That yeah. was what we valued. And so I get now to the West Coast of my new assignment, And these particular experiences have not been common to them, so I'm having to cast vision and wait for God to bring the pieces in place. Now that the pieces are in place, and I'm I'm feeling zero resistance. You know, on the East Coast, you kind of have to push through religion. West Coast don't have no religion. (laughs) They don't don't have nothing to unlearn. Yeah. So when you start talking to them about these moves, they just embrace it and they say, let's go. Mm -hmm. So the first Sunday I talked about this, they stayed in there an hour after I got tired. Yeah. And kept chasing God. And now miracles and signs and wonders are breaking out. And the church is multiplying on an unprecedented level. And they say, if you're animated, your church won't grow. It's crazy. I'm in the Bay Area of California Mm -hmm. where everybody has given up on. And I'm seeing God not build a church. I'm seeing God do a move. In his way, however he wants to do it. Come on, let's go. Let me get back to this. What we do that concerns me is we go straight into the room, shut off all the lights, make the room pitch black so that our stage looks good. I know why we do it. I've been doing TV for years. I understand all the dynamics. And we go straight to worship. I got with our record label and said, I want to write some praise songs. And one of the people in the room said, you'll be a unicorn. They said, nobody writes those no more. I said, I know, that's why I formed the record label. Because we have skipped the whole protocol. The reason we don't praise is because praise is the foolishness. It is. Praise is where David had to disrobe. He had to pull off his crown. He had to pull off his royal garments. And the Bible says he had to become undignified. 
And praise demands the crucifixion of pride and flesh so that worship can be true. You can't praise and be proud. It's impossible because it's too foolish. Right. Screaming, clapping, jumping, jumping, running, spinning, the loud cymbals, the stringed instruments, the shouting unto God with the voice of triumph. I mean, clapping your hands like cherry that's animated. Bombs. Yeah, that's what that you know. So, so what do we do? That is where things kind of can kind of get off the rails. So let's remove it. That's where the crazies come. Yeah, that's where the crazies come. Let's from that's where somebody might come in with a tambourine and somebody come in with a flag. Yeah. And we don't want weird. So let's let's praise and worship our way. So we are like Uzzah who got killed. We mm. if if we were not in the dispensation of grace, we'd have dead bodies Ooh. everywhere on Sunday morning. Goodness gracious. Because we all trying to touch a cart and we hadn't gone through the protocol. Jesus. You can't carry that cart unless it was holding the pole, the pole overlaid in gold, through the overlaid the ringlets. right way. It had to be on the shoulders of the priest, and the priest had to have blood on their nose, on their ear, on their fingers, and on their toes. My Lord. And if you touch it any other way, you die. You do not worship your way and get God's presence. No. You can worship. You can be passionate. You can love Jesus and tears. I'm not doubting the authenticity of yeah. your worship, but I'm talking about if you want the results of the presence of God, you will go through his protocol. And I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, and I will enter his courts with praise. What do they think David's referring to? And what was David always called up mm. about these courts? Oh? Mm. Better is one day in your, in your courts. Court. Mm-hmm. Than a thousand elsewhere. If I took you to Buckingham Palace, Hope, if you Googled it, you could go to Buckingham Palace, the kings, the royal family, and never see the queen. Right. Because it is separated by courts. Because the courts is the king's atmosphere and it's the environment he controls. So they will train you in the etiquette and the courts are progressive and advanced. So you are trained how to get from one court to the next court by obeying the etiquette. Ooh-wee. My God. Once you've advanced through the courts, you get to be in the presence of the king. And when you get in the presence of the king, make your prayers, enter the throne room of God boldly and make your prayers and petitions be made known to God. You can ask whatever you want. Will you have favor once because you get you, in there? If you've gone through the etiquette and valued the king's way, then you get the king's hand. So good. And we just shattered a million protocols and ignored them because we don't want to be weird. Well, so if I'm not weird, I'm like everybody else. I hope I can't affect it mm. if I am it. It's just another social club. I can't aff- I can't change you if I'm just like you. Right. So what is what is my concert different? And Beyonce's concert different. My hmm. what is, good music, people worshiping. Right. Production, dark room, lit stage. If if God's not there. Better is what David said, I can see a thousand doctors, but if I can get in your presence one time, I can go to a thousand therapists, but if I can get in your presence one time. It makes me think of the old Pentecostal church I was brought up in. Nothing special about it. Singing was horrible. Musicians were horrible. But I have, I mean, the altar services. They would get foolish too before God. People getting saved, healed. And it affects you. It does. It changes you. And, and, and once you've been in that, this other stuff, hope me and you, and I love them. I love them all. I've got, I've got no problem with anybody. Sitting questioning their salvation cares nothing. God has, the kingdom has keys. The keys give you access. You cannot access it without the keys. So to me, we've got a generation that don't know because they've never tasted. I never want an orange if I've never tasted an orange. 
But if you ever say, Ron, taste this, like the ones in California on orange trees, and I put it in my mouth, there's a longing. And then nothing else can compare. Nothing else will do. Yeah. So we've got a generation that don't know what they want because they've never tasted yeah. a, a move of God is not clean. We spent more time in our planning meeting yesterday planning on how to accommodate this move of God that's happening than anything else because it's not pretty and it's not 50 minutes right? and it's not cut and dry. It's a move. And that's what we want. And that's what I'm after. And I want a generation who I'm not sure. And they say in Generation Z is going to change that. Now, they're saying Generation Z is looking at all the production and they are not impressed. Yeah. And they're coming full circle back to there's something that we're missing and I want it. Yeah. Um, and we're going for it. Yeah, we're going for it. And I'm, I'm not Gen Z and I'm going for it. And that's who I am. Bef- you know, if you want to invite me, you need to know this. <laughs> you need to know. You know, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm older now, so I guess I'm just more direct. Don't invite me. And then and tell then me tell I can't. tell me everything that Ron Carpenter does, I can't do it. Then I'm not your guy. But you want to move? You want to shake things up? You want you want to light a fire? I'm your guy. Uh, if you just want it pretty and polished, I'm probably not him. I'm probably not him. You know what? You want to put him on a 20 minute timer? <laughs> I'm probably not him. And so I just, I had that bothered me that that's what those pastors hope they're sitting there saying, "Tell me how to plant a church." Yeah. And that's what they were told. God's house. Tell me how just, to start well, God's house. I wasn't there. I don't know the names of the people, but when Dwayne came, Pastor Dwayne, excuse me, came back to me, I just was like, oh, man. Because students become like their teachers. Yeah. And God help us. Well, redemption's going for it. In the generation we live in, have we ever needed a move of God? Yeah. And, uh, and see, that's another podcast. We're building churches bigger and better than we ever have. But the culture of our nation is deteriorating at a faster rate yeah. than ever, which tells me we are it. We're not different mm-hmm. from it because we can't change it. Yeah, not affected it at all. In fact, I heard the leader of one of these church planning movements in 2019, right before COVID, got up and said, all right, guys, i got to talk to you. We're getting way too secular. Hmm. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because you can't serve God and mammon. And if I get you saved, but I, you don't have to change anything, what are you getting saved from? Yeah. So this is who we are. This is what we're about. And I enjoyed it. I feel better now. I feel like I got to vent. So come on to redemption. <laughs> come to weird church. <laughs> we want to be weird as it gets if that's what the Holy Spirit wants. If it takes my foolishness. For God to descend upon a place and inhabit the praise of his people. Um, here, here again, it says God inhabits praise. If you cut the praise totally out. And praise it and pretty. Praise is not pretty. Isn't it? The word, I love how you uh, did the hitch thing. Just stay right here. Yeah. And I've been, That's telling, not I've been telling our people, I want them to start in the front and start in the aisles. Don't stand behind your chair and be pretty. Yeah. Now, you know, if, if, if that's... You know, you, well, I've gone too far, the money's too good, and the building's too full. Okay. Then you have to get up every day and look at yourself and, and say, have that. I led yeah. these people where God wanted me to lead them? And you will give an account for that. And um, sometimes you need to understand, and this will make half the guys turn it off right here, sometimes the depth of the experience does weed out some of the crowd. The broader the experience, when Jesus you know, wasn't asking anything from anybody. He filled up the hillsides. Yeah. But then he spun on them one day and said, unless you eat my flesh and drink, drink my, my blood. blood. And he said, hey, from you have that no part. day forward, they, they followed, followed him, him not. not. There is a place where you got to do what I preached a while back called the second yes. Yeah. The first yes is when you say yes to everything he wants to give you, salvation. The second yes is when you give him everything he wants. This has been great. This so anyway, has been great. Make me stop. I did. Shut me down. Shut you down. Your Mountain Dew's gone. Am I been ugly? No. Did I say it in the right spirit? Yes, it's been amazing. 
Um, thank you guys for being here. Share it, like it, subscribe. Uh, I love these times together. I love these talks. So until next time, it's Ron and Hope, unfiltered, real, raw, relevant. Love you guys. <laughs>